Folks, we're ready to go live. Ready? Let's go live. Thank you for watching us live on Global Voices Insight program, whether you are on YouTube, Facebook, or Twitch. And a warm welcome to those who will watch us later. Before we start our discussion, I just want to let you know that you can leave comments and also post questions to our panelists from any platform you're using, and we will be able to answer them towards the end of our program. My name is Philip Nubel. I'm the Managing Editor at Global Voices. And now I would like to introduce our two panelists for today. Tanya Lokot, who acts as the Eastern Europe Editor for Global Voices and is also a media scholar. And Philip Stoyanovsky, who is the Global Voices Editor for Central Europe and the Balkans and who is also an NGO activist based in Skopje in North Macedonia. Both of them have written about the politics of Eurovision. As you know, the 2021 Eurovision Song Contest is happening this week. In fact, the second semi-final will take place later today. And this is the topic we want to discuss today. What is Eurovision and what does it say about Europe? I will give you just two figures to start with. Eurovision is one of the longest ongoing television shows that started in 1956. And its last edition, which was in 2019, had 182 million viewers, which <laughs> makes it one of the most viewed entertainment shows in the world. But is Eurovision just a song contest about music and entertainment? In fact, it is much more than that. It is an opportunity for each country participating in the contest to showcase their identity, their culture, their language when they choose to sing in one of their national languages. One important distinction to make is that Europe in Eurovision has seen its definition change over the years. It was limited to Western Europe until 1961 when Yugoslavia joined. It then expanded after the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 to include Central and Eastern Europe. And it also expanded to the Middle East with Israel and for some time Turkey and Morocco. And finally, since 2015, it even includes Australia. So when images are at stake, a number of issues often surface, which we will be discussing today. One of the most interesting aspects of the history of Eurovision is how it has come to first accept and eventually champion gender, ethnic, and music diversity over the years. This has been particularly significant for the LGBT community. The flip side though, is that certain countries or parts of their societies have come to reject Eurovision or boycott it precisely because of this. We will discuss this today in details with our panelists. The second consequence of Eurovision being a space to showcase a country is that what was conceived initially as an entertainment contest has become a place for airing political disputes, conflicts that can be reflected by, for example, withdrawing from the competition or in the way one country votes for the other. Again, more about this today in our conversation. So to illustrate the issue of diversity, I propose we first watch together an interview with the Eurovision 2021 contestant for the Czech Republic. His name is Benny Cristo. He is of Czech and Angolan ancestry. And as you will see in the interview, he speaks very emotionally about this issue in the context of Eurovision and his home country, the Czech Republic. For Eurovision, you know, like winning the national round, when we were at the, at the place where they were you know, seeing the votes and stuff, and it came to the conclusion that I'm going to be representing. When they actually announced me as the winner, a guy in the back who's actually one of the famous Czech directors screamed, are you kidding me that we're going to be represented by a Negro? 
Thank you so much, uh, Benny, for accepting to uh, talk to us uh, for our special on the Eurovision. So, of course, my first question will be, what does the Eurovision contest represent for you? For me, what it represents is, uh, is basically an opportunity to uh, speak or to express myself to to broader audience. I've been doing music for over 10 years. I've been, you know, uh, doing a lot, but only in Czech Republic and Slovakia. And I just, I just wanted to test myself and see like, how would I do when it comes to other nationalities as well. Last year, uh, unfortunately, the Eurovision contest was canceled because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it's first time in its history since 1956. Uh, so how did that impact you because you were preparing for something that you know was had to be rescheduled so of, of course the the impact is massive when it comes to uh, everything the whole the whole plan and the whole idea of uh, how I wanted to um, present myself last year uh, I wrote a song uh, with my with my team glow sticks from uh, from Toronto the song is called uh, Ke Mama. Okay, mama you know. You can sing that was actually my initial way of of, uh, of the message that I wanted to basically put out there, which is I wanted to um, just tell about my story, tell about like what I've been through, and uh, kind of just wanted to say to the world, yo, here I am. I was uh, born in here, raised this way. This these were my like struggles, whatever, whatnot, and uh, yeah, here I am, still smiling and dancing. I just work like that, twenty four seven. Obviously, it, it got cancelled, and uh, I did get selected again for for this year. But the main rule was that the songs were not uh, allowed to be uh, used again. So uh, we had to come up with a new song, and um, there comes "Oh My God." Uh, "Oh My God" is another shortcut, just like "Your Mama" was for "Okay Mama." This was basically "Oh My God," but just like you know, uh, wordplay. I've already said everything in the in the Kemama song, so I didn't want to go too you know too deep and too serious. I think uh, all of the people all around the at least all around the Europe uh, and I think all around the world had uh, quite a lot of you know negative messages and like uh, negative energy around them and stuff. Honestly, don't care. I'm happy I trying to make you smile for a while now. Oh my God, you're beautiful. Why don't you come over? So I just wanted to uh, put out something positive and not really worry about anything too much and uh, definitely not about myself and about my problems because we all had problems, you know. Did a lot of them. A lot of things I wish I didn't do, yeah. Baby, come back, won't you play? Come back, yeah. My next question is about representation because you are a person of Czech and Angolan ancestry and you're representing the Czech Republic, which is a country and a society that comparatively, let's say, has little uh, ethnic diversity. What was your experience and, and why is it important that a person like you gets to represent the Czech Republic? Well, obviously growing up, I was, uh, I was actually one of the first people uh, of mixed color, of uh, you know, like Czech, Angolan. Uh, so growing up, people, kids were scared. So if you're scared, what you do, you you put that person down, lower the, lower your opponents or your fears, um, self-esteem and ego. And, and that's what they did quite uh, successfully. And um, yeah, throughout my life growing up, I, I've, I've been uh, dealing with uh, racism basically from the very start, from uh, like kids age where I, not not many kids wanted to wanted to play with me. Uh, it, it went all the way to me being like fully adult and trying to face the, uh, the aggressors and like getting beaten up pretty bad a couple, couple of times, having uh, injuries that are uh, uh, with me until today. I don't know, stuff like that definitely happened. That's why I actually wrote the song Ke Mama and uh, um, wanted to talk about this issue uh, to the to the rest of the Europe. And uh, but also say that I'm fine, I'm happy, and I'm dancing, I'm good. The bigger stage for uh, uh, diversity. The bigger stage for uh, expressing uh, one's in individual uh, uh, di differences, the better. And uh, Eurovision is definitely one of one of those big stages that uh, also to you know like check people shows that because like at one at one point yeah you, you can be like I am slightly like sometimes angry at the at the state that we're in and stuff that I have to um, you know even even up to up to date I, I still. I still have to like fight for being able to say that I'm Czech, you know, and I'm, 
uh, it's you know it's hard honestly don't care i'm happy this song was uh, uh produced by philip bocek who's uh Apart from being an amazing producer and a radio host, he's also a band uh, member of uh, John Wall Hooker. And um, uh, it was actually written in, in my flat. We had a we had a session here. He was doing the instrumental, and um, and I was just like kind of thinking. It wasn't even by the way, like because we were supposed to submit three different songs for Eurovision, uh, like to select uh, like the the Czech team. And uh, this song wasn't even written for Eurovision. It was just like it was written for fun. I, I wrote it because I. I was just feeling lonely and we were all feeling lonely. It was like the loneliest time where we couldn't, where we were, you know, like on a lockdown, we were not able to leave the, the house uh, after nine. We were not able to even like legally meet even like our family. It was just an overall positive song. Um, and the main message was, um, yo, don't, don't worry about how you look. I'm, I'm, I'm still, I'm still, I'm still buying it all. Wow, Right, so I think that Benny precisely illustrates very much this topic of diversity and whether, you know, Europe embraces diversity, whether Eurovision can play a role in that. By the way, we will be posting uh, this interview and interview of the next contestant on our YouTube channel. But now I want to invite Tanya and Philip to precisely join the conversation on what does Eurovision tell us about Europe? I think it's it's actually a really great uh, point that Benny Benny made when you know when he said that it's it's all about um, what is what is the kind of Europe that we want to see right and I think it's you know his struggle showcases also I think the struggle of many other contestants who over the years um, have come to represent their country because I think for Eurovision. Um, it is really important to, to show the reality of, of each of the European countries um, that participate in it. And, you know, very early on at the very start, that reality was, let's face it, mostly white um, and uh, not particularly diverse and mostly heteronormative. Whereas over time, we have come to see all kinds of um, really interesting personalities, people of all colors, people from all walks of life, people of you know, who identify um, as people of different genders um, or, you know, so so I think it's it's really, to me, um, an important platform for, uh, for showing the diversity. And I think then uh, it's really up to each country also to decide what kind of, you know, what kind of Europe they want to show and what kind of image of their country do they want to show? Does it have to be historical? Does it have to be kind of rooted in the country's traditions, or does it have to be more cosmopolitan? Absolutely. Mm. I feel Indeed. like I have thoughts on this. Yeah, uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, Yugoslavia was a Euro Eurovision contestant ba back in the day. And I remember as a kid that it was really a big deal because uh, it, we didn't talk about it in that sense. But being the only socialist country outside of the uh, Iron Curtain <laughs> and uh, the socialist bloc, it made us feel special. And also participating in activities such as Eurovision was something that showed that uh, special speciality or that uh, and it was also like like Tanya said there there was a time when the countries were trying to project certain image for instance in Yugoslavia the winner from Yugoslavia was from Croatia Dalmatia and it was a summer song uh, a song about dancing and uh, basically inviting tourists to come <laughs> to our <laughs> shores uh, and over time, I think there was really a big effort by the countries to understand what would appeal best to European audiences, especially because there was voting. Uh, during, at the time before the demo democracy, democratic changes and transitions, the issue of voting was also very interesting and novel for all the, for at least for the Yugoslavs, I would say because th there was some sort of democracy going on there that uh, 
that um, in a way uh, served as a precursor to the democratic changes that came in the 90s. And uh, also, I think now we have a situation over the years where, like you said, Eurovision is more a platform for diversity or platform for silliness. And different types of uh, tactics have been used by different countries in order to gain more attention either through through different gimmicks. So it has gained a reputation outside of Europe as something silly. I think there is a movie in, in Hollywood that represents this aspect of, of uh, the, the contest, but it's also much more. I think it means a lot to many people, but it's also uh, just uh, entertaining activity to do once a year. I want to say though that I think, you know, it's something like your vision, which yeah, it could be silly, but I think things can be both silly and also quite meaningful at the same time. Um, you know, the fact that even though maybe North America thinks that Eurovision is silly, but for some reason, starting next year, they're getting their version of Eurovision, which is going to be called the American Song Contest. And I'm like, well, if you think it's silly, why are you, you know, why are you getting your own? And this is going to be like the official sort of license thing um, that is going to be the North American counterpart. Um, and then, of course, the issue is like, well, if it's just in the U.S., why is it called the American Song Contest? What about all the other parts of America? Aren't they participating as well? Um, but I think, you know, this is this is the reality that we're facing today when um, something can be quite silly and almost over the top and camp, but can still be a platform to express really important and really serious ideas, you know, ideas about um what is Europe, which is one of the questions for, for our show today is like, well, is what is Europe? You know, is it just a bunch of like uh, white heteronormative people uh, wearing glittery costumes and dancing? Or is it a space which welcomes all sorts of um, flavors, all sorts of colors, all sorts of um, forms of expression, all sorts of genres of music? Right. Because I think one of the things that we've also seen is the huge variety of the kinds of songs that people choose, right? Because it's a fine balance between trying to represent your country and make it an attractive tourist destination, which of course lots of countries <laughs> care about. And on the other hand, um, you know, trying to promote an image of your country that is part of your national national brand, uh, kind of, you know, like, which is a, a really mm -hmm. serious issue and which is the, this whole sort of cultural diplomacy thing um, that many countries now see your vision as a big part of. I have a question to both of you. How do you think this diversity came to Eurovision? Because for those who are not aware, uh, there's first a sort of national contest. So each country organizes its contest. And of course, there is a national jury that decides to pick a song that will represent uh, themselves to, to the competition. But when you look at, uh, as you both said, of the you know older videos of the 50s or the 60s, it was very square, if I can use the term, even though it was Eurovision. And now we see that, you know, including this year, an incredible variety of ethnicity, of gender identity, of musical style, of style of performances as well. So do you think that the Eurovision jury and organization sort of understood the need to embrace this diversity? Or do you think it was pushed by the national juries? Or it's just the way that European society evolved and became more accepting um what do you think drove this diversity because really when you compare the 50s and you know even the the year 2000s and after that it's like night and day basically uh, maybe it reflects the diversity of the commercial music scene because mm -hmm. also if you if you compare what was presented in as an official in the across Europe in the 50s, 60s, up to 70s, where maybe there was some sort of rock explosion and uh, e mixing with the new modern genres, uh, we, we get a very square people in costumes. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I think at that time, the expressions of uh, ethnic, let's say ethnic or other diversity were relegated to um, to a special bracket within the music industry. Let's say Roma music or uh, even folk music was uh, 
measured according to quality, whether it's uh, original or new, or it, it I think it reflects first the diversity of the the music industry, but also many people, at least here in North Macedonia, believe that the agenda of uh, uh, promotion of human rights and other issues uh, and diversity as a representative is uh, something that is uh, part of the criteria. Mm -hmm. Similar like uh, uh, the open uh, promotion of anti-racism is part of uh, the rules of uh, professional sports. So there, I don't know, but I think it's a combination. And mm -hmm. also, uh, I guess with the European integration as a process, it is based on the human rights and diversity as values. So it's all connected to the also to the political atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, I agree with Philip in that. I think, you know, the, the entertainment industry and the music industry, just more generally across around the world, not just in Europe, seems to be somewhat more accepting of, of diversity. And I mean, obviously there are still issues and huge issues um, in terms of, you know, how much artists earn, et cetera, et cetera. But I think just in terms of like what, what, what can have a space um, and who gets to have a seat at the table and uh, you know a place on the stage. I think there's a little more sort of diversity by default in the music industry, um, right? So, um, and, and I think with, um, with your vision, we, we've seen you know, that they've obviously, as uh, an entertainment show and as a music industry product, they've kind of embraced that. And again, I'm not sure to what extent it's driven by the you know, European Broadcasting Union as the organizing body, because after all, the national selections happen nationally, right? right? But again, in each country, the selection process has evolved to only in part be, um, you know, it's not just up to the expert jury, it's also up to the popular vote and it's a combination of both and so i think to some extent it is perhaps a reflection of the shifting um moods in the country um in each of the countries about you know what what is acceptable to be put on the stage and who even gets a, a chance to try to be you know one of one of um the contestants and then of course you get also you know what what's what are the songs like because sometimes you know it's it's up to the songs but other times it's like you know, Ukraine is by far not the least conservative country, but it's also not the most conservative country. And and I think, you know, even in Eastern Europe, it's kind of, it's still quite, quite traditional. But at some point, you know, they decided that it would be perfectly fine to send a cross-dressing um, comedian uh, who also happens to sing, Verka Serdushka, you know, to just, just to, to send her or them to represent the country in this very, seemingly serious thing because Ukraine, you know, only started taking part in Eurovision in 2000, 2003 and their first one or two contestants were quite traditional in, in terms of like their singing, you know, they were like mainstream artists, but then you, you get Verka Serdushka and you're like, hmm. And obviously not all Ukrainians were happy with that selection, but you know, but it was voted quite, it was quite liked by the audiences. And so, you know, I mean, there you go. It remains one of the more iconic <laughs> I think. <laughs> to the extent that it, I think it even featured in a, in a Hollywood movie. Uh, so, yeah, like, I mean, does this scream Ukraine to you? Perhaps it does. <laughs> exactly. I think it shows precisely that, as, as you said, that, you know, your vision is a place where you can feel comfortable with diversity, with exploring. Um, mm -hmm. One question that I have to both of you is, you know, there is this popular view and I'm curious to see whether you agree or not and how you sort of see this. But if you are in the Eurovision, it's sort of a membership to the European club, European not meaning EU, European Union, but in general European. Uh, and that has explained sometimes why some people want some countries, you know, had a big drive to join, but then some of them had second thoughts, some withdrew for, for a very long period of time, sometimes just for one year. So do you think that it's true that by being represented in the Eurovision, it's a claim on your Europeanness? And that's why maybe the show is 
popular and is viewed, as I mentioned earlier, 180 million viewers mm -hmm. in 2019, all across Europe and beyond, of course. Yes, yes, I think uh, Eurovision is part of a common European identity. And uh, I mean, it's sometimes paradoxical, but when Italy won, I think, at the beginning of the 90s with the song Unite, Unite Europe, then they dropped out of the <laughs> contest for a few years, <laughs> for many years, uh, because of their internal decision that it's, I don't know, uh, not worthy. But it is really interesting how people accept this as part of, of the overall, like you said, membership of the club. Because um, uh, when you see how people react at uh, the national level to their successes or uh, not or failures, let's say. It's not a failure if you're not voted out by... by but uh, uh, people are very emotional. Those who are into it, they get very emotional because they see it also as validation of their identity. So it's... Um, I think it's, it's very important in that sense, not only in the sense of popularity, but also yeah. in the... Yeah, and I think it's, you know, it's also... Um, I mean, being part of Europe is, I think, a really it's a really complicated question. Like, do, do you, you know, who gives you the right to be part of Europe? Like, it's, it's a very contentious question. I think especially for many countries that are more recent additions to kind of the idea of Europe or, you know, to, um, to the space, um, they will take every chance they get to join this discussion, to even have a seat at the table, to be heard discussing whether or not you're part of Europe or not, I think is very important. And it's obviously a really contentious question. Uh, and perhaps Eurovision is maybe seen as a, like a more safe platform to have this debate um, because it's not, at least on the surface, you know, it's not as fraught as like, you know, being part of the Eastern Partnership and sitting at the table with the European Union countries and trying to prove that you're worth being accepted into the Union. Like the stakes are a little lower. You're just saying. <laughs> yeah, and for, for the artists also, it's uh, for many who don't really who cannot really break out of their own national market, it's a chance of their lives for some. Mm. Uh, and very often uh, it's really um, a thing that is reflected both on personal and on the international level. If you get to talk to people abroad about certain Eurovision experience, you you receive something that we have lost by using the internet because we are all micro audiences to different types of cultural content mm -hmm. and uh, unlike in the 80s or 70s when there was tv that everybody watched and everybody knew what happened at a certain show like dynasty or whatever but uh, now this is only one of the few uh, remnants of the of this unifying TV culture, the culture of broadcast TV, definitely. So uh, we're going to move now to the second issue that I mentioned earlier. We have already questions coming in, so please keep uh, posting comments and sending questions mm -hmm. on whatever platform you you're using right now. We'll get to them mm -hmm. after the second uh, discussion. So, um, as we said. The issue of diversity is one that is, is, is brought up by uh, Eurovision, but there is also the issue of political disputes, uh, and it can relate to identity, to the language spoken and chosen for the song and things like that. So to illustrate this, uh, I would like us to look at the uh, second interview that we did with the, uh, another contestant from the 2021 Eurovision uh, uh, Song Contest. His name is Vasil. He's from North Macedonia, and he shares with us what precisely Eurovision means for him. Maybe they all try to break us, not knowing it's what makes us. It was 1990, and I remember it was Tai Chi, but more than that, it was Spanish, the duo, the Bandido song. That was one of the ones, you know, that I remember hearing that, and ever since, I was so obsessed. Thank you very much, Vasil, for giving us some time for an interview here at Global Voices. And of course, the first question that comes to mind is, what does the Eurovision represent for you? 
Ooh, what a simple yet hard question. <laughs> you know, one word, everything. It's one of those, I don't know if I would call it stamp of approval, but yes, this is the stamp of approval, the crowning mm -hmm. that you finally get this chance to represent to show yourself by representing your country from north macedonia Hello. so the responsibility of that is unbelievable this has been a childhood dream of mine the macedonian radio television mrt announced earlier today that faint pop and opera singer vasil garvanliev will represent the balkan nation north macedonia so the fact that it has come true and in a way this is my Third charm, lucky charm, you know, night 2019, I was backing vocal. Shine your light, go and break the rules. Vocal coach last year was chosen, but it was canceled due to COVID. I just want to dance with you tonight. I want and here I am this year, here I stand, pun intended. When I remember that. So it is the biggest honor one of those accomplishments that I hope is a life-altering event and a platform that will give me an even bigger voice and responsibility in the world of music through the arts. Trust your heart and just stay strong Cause baby, they all try to have the impression that your vision can play a role in promoting all kind of diversity, whether it's based on ethnicity, on gender, on language, on culture, on community. And can it achieve that both in the home country where the singer or the performer is, but also in the broader uh, sense? Totally. I, my answer to what I see Eurovision as, it's a tapestry of culture. And the beauty of it is that we really are all one family. The fans, the singers, the delegations that you get to to meet and be introduced to different styles of music, languages, and cultures. So yes, I think it's very important and important for us artists to, to speak up and share where we come from, what we stand for. So I think it is a beautiful way to introduce diversity through everything because, you know, bottom of it all, we are human beings with a beating heart. The rest is just colors. Last year, unfortunately, we missed Eurovision because of the pandemic. As we know, the world stopped and it was not, not an easy thing. It was a hard thing, especially for the arts. We took a really, really big hit, still are taking the big hit. And I admit last year when the contest was canceled, I was devastated. It was, you know, I've been working so hard. And for us, Macedonia, we have an internal selection. So I did not even know that I'm coming back this year. So I said, I've worked my butt off and it's canceled so it's like does my dream end does it continue so i was so glad this year when they asked me to go again and i think what we're doing this year is so beautiful that i feel like eurovision will be the global test everybody in the arts will watch this thing that is already happening and i believe very successfully that there's hope that we are taking a step for the new normal the first rehearsal i had in the arena i still feel the vibration of that emotion because it had been such a long time since I stepped on stage. So I said, I'm so glad. I already feel like a winner just by being able to be here and stand in the arena. So very, very glad and thankful for that. I have another question about uh, how people in North Macedonia relate to Eurovision. Since when uh, did the North Macedonia join Eurovision? Do people watch it? Is it a big thing? Macedonia National Television, yes, they broadcast it. It's since the 90s, I believe 96, 97, Vlado Yanovsky was the first to represent Macedonia, and then it has been going on since. The audience is half and half, depends. You know, people watch it, it depends on the year, so yes, definitely the euphoria is there, and to those who don't know or don't follow Eurovision, it's kind of like sports, you know, when you have a big... Um, somebody had just mentioned or compared it to the Super Bowl, which is very interesting. So Eurovision is kind of the Super Bowl for us, or I always call it the Olympics of singing. So yes, there's a lot of support and people are very curious to see what happens, how you do, why you do. Last year, my song had a combination of an old Macedonian folk song with a modern English melody. This year we went, ended up going for an English song, but funny enough, even though it's an English song, 
I did my all to include as many Macedonians as I can. So when you watch the music video, all the orchestra that you see is prominent Macedonian musicians. In the gallery, you see this display of beautiful artwork by all Macedonian artists. So even though I'm singing in English, Macedonia is with me. <laughs> there are times when I remember back and all I do. What a voice. And I noticed that Vasil used two really key expressions that I think are a very good introduction to, to the second discussion. He used the word stamp of approval as we were discussing whether, you know, being in the Eurovision is a stamp of approval of being European. And he also mentioned Olympics of singing, which I think is a very nice way to describe the Eurovision. But it also precisely relates to, as we know, uh, sports is another arena where, you know, countries have political fights, uh, you know, can use boycott, banning, all kinds of, of things that are happening. And uh, both of you have been writing about this issue. So can you tell us more about how the Eurovision uh, is also used to sort of, you know, fight political battles? I think it's actually really ironic because, you know, Eurovision itself proclaims that it's a space free from politics and they would like to stay away from politics as much as possible um, because that doesn't seem to get through to the countries participating because for them it, it is continually about politics, right? So um, in the past countries have used um, Eurovision as a platform to make political statements. Uh, you know, we've, we've um, obviously seen um, country name changes disputed. We've also seen countries banned from Eurovision. So um, Georgia famously pulled out of, of Eurovision in 2009 um, after you know the Georgian-Russian war when they uh, their song made an explicit statement and comment on on uh, Russia's role in the war and they were asked to change the lyrics and they refused and they pulled out. This year Belarus was banned from the contest because again both of the songs they've submitted were explicitly political and were pro-government at that and were very much in favor of the government's crackdown on, on the protests that have been happening in the country. Um, so they they had to pull out as well after both of their songs were, were basically banned from, from the show. So I think it's it's really difficult for Eurovision to claim that, you know, they are a space free from politics and no matter what their rules say, um, I think, you know, um, they are still part of the political debate and they are still part of the political um, diplomacy that you know takes place um, so there is all this background that's happening even though we may not see any of this on the stage mm -hmm. right. yeah well and I think um, also uh, the political aspect is first dominant in the national level and then also international like mm -hmm. uh, and you can read so much into some of the things that show up at Eurovision, and then maybe to uh, to unpack many many things. For instance, I think for me one of the best performers at Eurovision is Ruslana from Ukraine, who was uh, uh, combining different elements. Uh, and you can say that maybe uh, their costumes are ancient Slavic or folklore. This is elements of Ukrainian folklore all over the place but mm -hmm. uh, uh, also uh, because of who she was at the local stage uh, whether of what values did it rep did she represent and also what she did after with her fame like joined the revolution at the time the protests against rigged elections mm -hmm. of uh, which led to huge uh, changes of the direction the country was going later and she became some sort of a symbol both inside the country but maybe even more outside because the the country gained much um, attention through eurovision but it coincided with uh, huge political events going on there and uh, she later toured europe uh, she was uh, able to get her other values besides music uh, through her through this platform and then she went and joined parliament. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How did she go, in fact? Because afterwards we didn't get to get to, to learn more, much more about her. 
Yeah, well, I mean, she, she was a member of parliament for quite some time, but I, I don't know that she necessarily like was super prominent or super instrumental. But I mean, very much part of the I think progressive uh, part. But yeah, I mean, you know, it's 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 interesting uh, where you know this may not necessarily have any political implications. Um, I think even some countries' participation, but also how the countries vote for each other, and you know, the whole like conspiracy theory network. Um, I've seen some of the diagrams that people share on, <laughs> on on the internet about how different countries decide who they're going to give votes to and what does it actually mean when, you know, somebody gets 12 points and somebody gets 10 and how it changes year from year. And some countries have these like long standing alliances where they only vote for each other and someone never votes for, for another country. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, despite the rules, the official rules of the contest, and despite how much the, you know the European Broadcasting Union says we are a space free from politics, I think it's really difficult to to keep politics out of your vision. No matter if we're talking about national politics or like human rights issues and things like that, you know, people will continue to make statements because it's such a public platform, and as you say, it draws a huge amount, huge amount of attention every year. Definitely. Um precisely related to this sort of political definition of Europe that we already talked about a little bit, what is your view on this sort of expansion of Eurovision? So first towards Eastern Europe, to the Middle East, uh, and now for some reason uh, to Australia, which is definitely very far <laughs> from Europe, but still it has been an official member since uh, 2015. Uh, this year, because of COVID and vaccination issues, the performer couldn't come because you have to perform live as per the rules, but they made an exception. Uh, so what do you think about this sort of moving geography uh, in a political sense of Europe? Well, it, it's also about the definition of Europe, uh, whether you define it as a territory or you define it as a set of values. Uh, for me, it, it was often a point of uh, strangeness like why why this country appeared now and whatnot but then i realized it's not about uh, geography because it is really something something else if people like it then they are entitled to <laughs> enjoy it so if australians who actually are very recent uh, most of them <laughs> came from europe uh, or their recent ancestors uh, it is uh, really something that possibly these people brought with them there and uh, became part of their uh, host uh, now native culture <laughs> but <laughs> it's also um i think like you said there are many machinations or many conspiracy theories or uh, about uh, how to win the euro, euro song and um uh, for instance, one big aspect, at least in the Balkans, is how the diaspora would vote. And very often even politicians call on, on our compatriots in the other countries to vote for our uh, representative in order to show the world and what we are all about and, and so on. And very often you, there are some um, correlations in this sense that people with a huge amount of diaspora from certain countries get to get the votes but also there was uh, uh, and there was like you said um the theories about the scandinavian lobby who always vote for it for each other <laughs> then there is the theory of the ex-yugoslav balkan lobby who also supported each other but it's really possibly also a matter of taste a matter of knowing maybe the language or the, the people who are singing or just uh, feeling some sort of affinity, especially in the, in the countries where the voting is, or uh, when in the instances of the contest when the voting is prevailing. Now, uh, in the recent years, there was very hybrid model of deciding. In some countries, it's a committee. It's not even a festival where, like in the past, where people would would vote like from the audience and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And uh, last year we had a huge uh, difference in points from the experts and from the popular vote. Right. But I think it's evol evolving uh, system. 
and uh, it is interesting because all these different models are also uh, in a way reflecting the transition to democracy which everybody is doing even the old democracies need to adjust to the new digital environment and find new ways to relate to their to their citizens and vice versa so this is normal <laughs> or expected <laughs> I think it's really interesting, though, that, you know, as as um, as you say, like as more and more countries enter this sort of space, um, to me, what's one thing that's interesting is that I think, you know, there's still like as more and more countries join your vision, um, it, it kind of becomes this almost like a way to, to reckon with, you know, the history of Europe, which is a really messy history. And, you know, it's a history of shifting borders. It's also a history of colonial settlement and a history of conflicts and wars, but also a history of lots of shared cultural traditions, histories, again, right? So there's 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 a complicated past. Um, and I think maybe, you know, this is one of the ways of reckoning with it because, you know, you look at an embroidered shirt that different contestants are wearing and you're like, is this a Ukrainian shirt or is this a Bel Belarusian shirt or is, you know, so very often it's like, it's almost hard to tell where something comes from. You know, it's it's like the perennial question of borscht is it is it a ukrainian dish or god forbid is it from another country i mean of course i'm ukrainian so it is definitely a ukrainian um, food stuff um, but i think interestingly that you know the transition to democracy at least in performatively in some countries or like oh well okay everybody is a democracy now so we might as well it, it also brings uh, forth the very messy nature of democracy like you know the whole the changes in the voting systems and the change in how now we also need to try and ensure that there is no ballot stuffing in terms of people voting through text messages because obviously people are also trying to game this system so it's like you know the more opportunities there are and the more different technical uh, uh, options there are the more we need to ensure that you know there is still some kind of fairness and that there is still some kind of um, open, transparent, competitive spirit that you, like you really want somebody to win fairly, no matter how much of the stuff is going on in the background. Yes, and also uh, going back to other continents participating, some of the uh, impact of the some of the Eurovision songs is uh, actually global, like regardless of and even it's it's not really related to whether they have won the contest or have gained a lot gained a lot of points. For instance, Moldova, they have uh, not won yet, <laughs> but uh, some of their songs have become internet memes, mm -hmm. like uh, 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 the epic sax guy, which we see <laughs> at, at the at the at the screen from Sunstroke Project, but. And they actually, this is something, uh, the tune, the uh, the image, it's accepted by people who might not even know about Moldova <laughs> much, but uh, uh, by kids who live in the US or kids who live in Korea or wherever uh, across the internet because they have become part of the global internet meme culture. Mm -hmm. So it is really uh, something that, uh, can be seen as a uh, some um, as a source of uh, global content, not only yeah. European. And we define Europe from G Gibraltar to the Caucasus and nothing else, or where <laughs> <laughs> whatever the the Ural Mountains are. Or the not. language, the language of memes is universal. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I think your vision is actually like one of the really important cultural roles that your vision plays. It's it's a great source of content for internet memes. Like, where would we be without your vision? I mean, every year, right? It's there's something. There's some at least mm -hmm. one contestant or more that ends up being a really really uh, successful meme. I will say, Philip, though, I disagree with you. I think winning is still really, really important in Eurovision. Like, it's it's so important. <laughs> yes, indeed. All right. yeah. I think uh, we can conclude on one idea is that definitely the Eurovision is also about politics and it will remain so and get even maybe more political uh, in the years to come. Uh, so thank you, Philip, and thank you, Tanya, for, for discussing this issue. And now we want to open the floor to questions uh, from our audience. 
So if we can bring up, I think we had a question from Belgium. Uh, I can read it or it's showing also on the screen. I was wondering whether your vision was a way for Central and Eastern Europe to have more visibility in a very Western Europe centered world. I remember as a teenager learning the names of many countries I had never heard before living in Brussels. For example, seeing France and Spain and the UK last was a bit of a humbling experience for this part of Europe, I believe. I would agree. What do you think? Indeed, yes. Yes, especially after the breakup of uh, Yugoslavia and Soviet Union, all the new countries, which were not actually new, but uh, were newly independent, <laughs> uh, became uh, very eager to show themselves to the world. And... Uh, I guess this was one venue that I can relate to the experience of Melissa from the yeah. Yeah, I think I agree. I think, you know, in this way, it's your vision is one of those really important opportunities. Well, of, of course, to showcase your culture and to showcase, you know, um, the music and the talents, but also to showcase your country um, to the point where, you know, some people may have heard the name of the country but they may not have any idea about what it's what it's like and i think i remember again for ukraine you know when it hosted like when it won your vision for the first time and then for the second time and both times hosting your vision the next year after that mm -hmm. was such an important moment because right. many of the people who showed up for for your for your vision you know many of whom tr do like do this like a, a religiously every year they travel to the country where the contest is um like for them this was their first opportunity to actually you know travel to ukraine and to, to see what the country is like and many of them ended up falling in love with it and i'm sure the same is true for a lot of the other eastern um you know and central uh, and southern european countries which maybe weren't on the tourist radar as much but nonetheless every country has quite a lot to offer, right? And this creates a nice attention moment in which that country can say, look, there's more to us than just whatever, you know, the stereotypes are. There's there's a rich history and a rich culture and there's all these amazing landscapes. And also we sing really well, so. Definitely, I think that Eurovision, we can argue, is a, a big lesson in European geography. Uh, whether you're just watching or, as you said, Tanya, even traveling for the hardcore fans. And uh, I remember watching, you know, uh, Eurovision with, with friends who, you know, had traveled less and precisely, uh, oh, yeah, by the way, what is the life in this country, you know, after seeing a song? And precisely it sort of provided suddenly a real image uh, or one of the images of what that country could represent. So... I think that's part of why it's still uh, also very attractive to so many viewers. I think we also have a comment or a question from Alexander Isokaev. I am not sure I pronounce well, but thank you for the comment. Um, so I may be able to read just the beginning. People are not indifferent to Eurovision Song Contest, as it is, in my view, a mix of music and sport contest. I think some of us mentioned that already, the Olympics uh, of, of singing, <laughs> definitely. Any reaction to this comment? Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, and it, it's, 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 it's like this, the positive competitive spirit, because, you know, like, obviously winning is important but i the the good thing about it is that like there's no you know, like if somebody doesn't come first or doesn't come in the top five like people still like each other you know which is more normal i think in sports than you know it might be in other areas but it's like it's a healthy competitive spirit where people compete but they also cheer for each other and like everybody is you know happy to be there just you know because they've already gone through the national competition stages. So I think like that is really nice because it's just like, this is how healthy competition works. You know, everybody enjoys the moment and not just winning, but also just being there and just getting to hang out with other cool people, um, you know, who enjoy wearing glitter and sequins and, and whatnot. And I think, you know, we need more moments like that. So, I mean, it's no wonder that, you know, so many people watch every year. It's just a nice bit of positivity. 
Definitely. This was, I don't know if you watched the first semi-final the other day, but it was mentioned by the presenters uh, several times that just the fact of, you know, being in, in outside of Rotterdam, despite the pandemic, uh, is itself in itself, you know, a victory and part uh, of the uh, enjoyment. Uh, I have a question to both of you on the issue of language, because in the history of Eurovision, actually, the body itself changed its policy. In the beginning, you had to sing in one of the national languages, then English or other languages were allowed. It went back and forward. My understanding now, it's completely free. You can mix languages. You know, for example, the Malta singer was singing in French and English uh, the other night. Um, I know that Benny, the song is mostly in English, but there are a few phrases in Czech. So what do you think about this sort of uh, mix of languages and how Eurovision changed its policy? Well, I think it's uh, it's interesting how people think very seriously about it. Some view it from the competitive advantage angle, like if whether to sing in English so everybody would understand them or to promote their own language because it's an opportunity for Europe to hear it <laughs> like no other. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the mixing of the languages is also very present. Like. This year we had a performance from Croatia, who uh, sang mostly in English, but she actually had the same song in Croatian and several other languages, I believe, uh, and uh, used th these versions to promote the song during uh, the pre-contest uh, phase to, to get more, uh, more uh, appealing to, to, to audiences abroad. And then at the performance, she she had several lyrics uh, sung in uh, Croatian. Right. So, and it blended perfectly for me because I could understand both, but it's, <laughs> it's, I think it's, a, it's also good for people who don't speak the, another language, one of the languages in the song, if you have mixed, uh, mixed uh, lyrics or, or chorus. Definitely. Yeah, I agree. I think I think you know, be, having options is always good because obviously each country has a different relationship with its national language or national languages, and the debates vary from country to country. So it's nice to have the opportunity if you want. But as Philip said, I think a lot of artists have in the past and even this year they've released several different versions or it's a mix of things. So they have options, and it's really good because it does allow them to potentially promote the song to. A wider audience but i think also there's now this whole like cottage industry of um, helpful websites that will give you translations and the bands themselves i know the ukrainian band this year goa they've made a, like a translation of the lyrics available because their lyrics are actually a folk ukrainian song uh, but they've made it available in english as well so people understand what the song is about right and on that note i think we will wrap up so thank you so much, Tanya and Philip, for uh, speaking with us today. Uh, I think that it was really enriching and we learned a lot and there's so much more to explore. Um, I would like to also thank our audience and also for sending your comments uh, and questions. If you are a Eurovision fan, please do watch the second semi-final. It's today, uh, very soon, and the finals will be on the 22nd on Saturday. Uh, also, if you're not familiar with Global Voices, please read our coverage uh, about events and topics. Uh, we have uh, different sections and we also publish in uh, over 30 languages. Many of those are actually spoken and sung during the Eurovision. So just go to our website and you'll be able to sign up to receive our daily and weekly newsletter. You can also follow us on Twitter at Global Voices and of course on Facebook uh, and on YouTube. And on this note, thank you so much and enjoy the show. <laughs>